Hey guys, my name is Kenton Cool. I am a professional mountaineer and I've stood on the summit of Everest no less than 14 times. So I feel that I'm in a pretty good place to take you safely on the journey. Now our journey will start in Kathmandu, the bustling, colorful, polluted, noisy capital of Nepal. And after a couple of days there, then our journey starts in earnest. And to begin with, what we have to do is to fly to Lukla Airport, which is deep in the Himalayas. Now you get on a little um, twin engine propeller plane and you fly through the Himalayan foothills and then out of nowhere in the distance, you can see the strip of Lukla. It's meant to be one of the one of the most dangerous airports in the world. The runway is inclined 15 degrees. And as the plane comes in, there's no, there's no instrument landing here. It's all line of sight, dead reckoning. The pilots are working hard. You get off, all the other passengers get, get on who are leaving Lukla and uh, the plane uh, hardly stops, turns around and shoots back down the runway uh, as airborne gain disappearing into the distance. And you're left there on the tarmac at the very start of the adventure to Everest Base Camp. Two days trekking will get you to Namchi Bazaar, the Sherpa capital. Well, we call it a capital. It's tiny compared with uh, most, uh, most villages or towns uh, or certainly capitals uh, around the world. And it's nestled in this perfect amphitheater with the most amazing view looking out to some of the neighboring mountains of Kusum Kangaroo or, or Kwande. There are no motor vehicles at all. So everything comes uh, on the back of the porters uh, or perhaps on the back of, uh, back of the yaks. After a couple of days in Namchi Bazaar, then our bodies acclimatized. We're back on the trail, heading towards base camp. And from this point onwards, the view is dominated by the most beautiful mountain, I think, in the world, Amadabla, often called the Matterhorn of the Himalayas. Beautiful mountain, and she will dominate the view for the next four or five days. And then after about seven or eight days trekking, depending on how fast you are, you do finally arrive at Everest Base Camp. And the odd thing about this, you can't actually see the summit of Everest from the base camp. In fact, you can't really see the mountain at all. The base camp is nestled at the end of the Kumbu Valley. And at, at one end you have the, the Lola, which is a pass between China and, uh, and Nepal. And you have these colossal mountains. You have Ling Trim and Pomori and Nupsi. They really dominate the skyline. A fantastic, jagged looking mountains. But if you want to see Everest herself, you have to head down the valley a little bit. She just pokes her nose out every now and then on the trek. So you've got to keep an eagle eye open for her. Now, Everest Base Camp, for many, will be the pinnacle of the achievement. But for those who are looking to go that little bit further, that little bit further above and beyond, and those who are looking to go to the summit, this is their starting point. We're now at 5,300 meters above sea level. Now that's higher than Mont Blanc, which is the highest point in Western Europe. That just puts it into perspective. But at some stage, the climbers have to start looking upwards. And the first obstacle that the climbers have to overcome is the Kumbu Icefall, a river of ice that crashes down the mountainside. And as it comes down the mountainside, it, it um, encounters like a big drop off, a steepening in the slope angle, and the ice breaks open. So it is a very dangerous place, but at the same time, as I said, it's a, it's a thing of absolute beauty. And the climbers have to find their way through this, round the crevasses, over the narrow fins of ice, and occasionally we find a crevasse we can't go around. So in those instances, we have to build a, a uh, literally a bridge of ladders, and you will see the climbers very tentatively climbing across these ladders to get to the other side. Once up the top of the icefall, you have the Western Coombe open out. The Western Coombe is a hidden valley, 
first person ever to see into the Western Coombe was back in 1921. George Mallory. He was on the very early Everest expeditions and he climbed up from China or Chinese Tibet onto what's known as the Nup La, a coal between the two countries of China and, uh, and Nepal. And it's maybe a kilometer, kilometer and a half wide and maybe five kilometers long. And it's bounded by Everest herself on one side, Mount Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain in the world at the end. And on this side, your right hand side as you're walking up the valley is Mount Nupsi, the 19th highest mountain in the world. It is without a doubt, the most beautiful place I have ever been. It's sensational. And this is the site of Camp 2 on Everest. And Camp 2 is a staging point where the climbers might rest and recover uh, for a uh, little while and we store our equipment while our bodies slowly acclimatize to the altitude. And it's relatively comfortable if you consider the height of nearly 6,400 meters above sea level. Now, from Camp 2, our eyes start being drawn up towards the summit. Finally, at some stage, our weather window will occur because the thing that governs whether we can climb to the top of Everest or not, is the jet stream. The wind, that super high altitude that blows so fiercely, can be up to 200 miles an hour. And it's utterly impossible to climb the mountain when that wind is blowing. So as climbers, we have to wait for the, for the weather to be just right. And it's a, it's a little battle between the jet stream and the monsoon. And as the monsoon builds up in the Bay of Bengal and becomes more powerful, it slowly pushes the jet stream north. And the climbers have a very brief period where the jet stream gets pushed north and the monsoon's not quite arrived. And that is our chance to get to the top. We'll climb up from camp two. Uh, up to camp three, partway up the Lhotse face. The Lhotse face is where the ice for the Kumbu Icefall comes from. It comes cascading down from the upper reaches of Mount Lhotse and forms a unrelenting wall of ice, average angle of maybe 50 degrees. And it's perhaps 15, 1600 vertical meters of uninterrupted snow and ice. It's so big we have to dig out the tent platforms for camp three there. And that's where we spend our penultimate night. We wake in the morning, we don our oxygen gear and our down suits for the first time, and we grind our way up, getting ever higher to the last camp on Everest, camp four on the South Coal. This is now at 8,000 meters above sea level. Now this is what the climbers call the death zone, where there's not enough oxygen in the atmosphere, to keep the climbers alive. Hence the reason why we use supplementary oxygen. Camp four, always windy. You battle to put the tents up in the wind. You crawl inside them for a few hours rest in your sleeping bag. Try and get some food and nutrition and water down inside you. And then the climbers leave about 10 o'clock at night to start battling their way to the very roof of the world. Now the reason why we start at 10 o'clock at night is to allow us enough time. We climb up upwards in the middle of the night, hoping to get to the balcony for dawn. That's 8,500 meters. Happens to be the site of Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing, the guys that made the first ascent of Everest back in 53. The balcony was their last tented site or tented campsite before the summit. But for us, it's an oxygen changeover point. And we swap one cylinder, pull a fresh cylinder of oxygen on our backs and head up towards the south summit. By now, the sun should be coming up over our right hand shoulder, casting a mesmerizing shadow of Everest herself on the lower part of the Kumbu Valley. It is one of the most wonderful sights ever. But the climbers have to stay focused. We come to the south summit, 8,700 meters. We drop down slightly. And this is arguably the most precarious point of the whole climb. We very carefully pick our way across the ridge 
to the site or what used to be the Hillary Step. And although now it's just snow rather than rock, it's still a barrier for the climbers. But get up and over that and then boom, the summit slopes start to ease off and you've got the last perhaps 25, 30 minutes to the summit. And when you get there, ah, oh, it is something to behold. You're stood there, you will be the highest person on the planet. Just imagine that for one second. The whole world is underneath your feet. And the view stretches forever in all directions. It is beyond words. But of course, the climbers are only halfway there. You still have to make it back down. And as a very good friend of mine, the American climber Ed Vistas famously once said, getting to the top is optional, but getting back down is mandatory. Now the descent is always fraught with danger, but the climbers staying focused with a great Sherpa team around them will carefully pick their way back down the mountain. They will get back down to camp four, pack up their belongings if there are time, and then come all the way back down to camp two to stay in another night on the mountain. But by the time the climbers get to camp two, they kind of know that the ascent is in the bag. They've only got to get up in the morning and then make their way back down through the Kumbu Icefall, back to base camp. And once you're at base camp, well, that's where the relief and the celebration can finally set in. We celebrate initially with cups of tea to rehydrate, but we perhaps swiftly move on to this wonderful uh, locally brewed beer called Chang, which is made from a fermented sort of rice water. And then of course, everything is slightly tinged with sadness because the end of the expedition is nigh. And that's always a sad thing because that experience is now gonna be put in our memory banks. And no matter how many expeditions we do, how many adventures that we go on, no two adventure is exactly the same. And that's the wonderful thing about adventure. It's different for everybody. And people say sometimes, how come you climbed Everest 14 times with all the other mountains around in the world? Well, it's not just Everest I climb, I do climb all over the world. But I have a special love affair with that one mountain. And it is def different every single time I go there. Now, climbing Everest isn't available to us all, but we all do have our own Everest inside us. And that may be running a 5K race. It may be going camping in your back garden. Or in my case, it is Everest herself. But the important thing is that we identify what our own Everest is and we plan for it and then we go and do it. Because trust me, adventure will bring you alive. Now you can join me on a live Q&A session um, once this has gone live and I look forward to seeing you all live then. Have your questions ready? Doesn't matter how silly you think the question may be or how intricate or complex it may be. Store them up and get in contact and I'll be delighted to let you know what the answer is. So for me now, take care, be safe, and I hope to see you all in the mountains one day soon. Take care.